Let us, for a brief moment, return to the not-too-distant world of 1945, when Britain gloriously triumphed over the evil forces of fascism. Admittedly, Britain didn't win alone. As the saying goes, the Second World War was won with Soviet blood, American steel, and British intelligence. But among the three victors, it is without a doubt the USA that came out on top. As the only major country unravaged by the war, America represented a staggering 50% of the world's GDP in the summer of 1945. It was in sole possession of by far the strongest navy and air force on Earth. But perhaps even more importantly, it held an absolute monopoly on nuclear weapons, having just demonstrated their potency in Japan twice. So with such hegemonic power, why didn't America stomp its future arch-rival, the USSR, out of existence right there and then? And even if not immediately, the Soviets didn't get their own nukes until 1949, leaving the US with plenty of time to defeat not just them, but perhaps all enemies of capitalism across the globe, finally uniting the Earth under the one true economic system. Megalomaniac daydreaming aside, let us indulge this hypothetical. What would a US-Soviet war have looked like in 1945? Well, for a start, it wouldn't have been nuclear. For while America had the knowledge of how to produce atomic bombs, actually making them was a painfully tedious process. Even towards the end of 1945, the US had zero nuclear bombs ready for deployment and was only producing around one and a half nuclear cores per month, which ignores all the additional assembly time required. In the backdrop of this nuclear deficiency, in Europe, the Soviets held a major numerical advantage, with three times as many soldiers and twice as many tanks and tactical aircraft than all of the other allies combined. The only category where Britain and America held any sort of advantage was in strategic aircraft. Which, incidentally, is quite useful because that's what you need to drop atomic bombs. But that still wouldn't have made nuking Moscow a cakewalk. Remember, unlike Japan, the USSR of 1945 had a vast arsenal of anti-aircraft weapons and a seasoned air force that would make nuclear bomber missions far more difficult to execute. But even if the US managed to successfully launch a surprise attack on the USSR by, say, nuking Moscow and Leningrad, the Red Army would still have no trouble at all rolling over the Allies in Western Europe. After all, it's mostly flat terrain, and that's hard to defend. The only places where America and Britain could plausibly hold back the Soviets would be certain Atlantic coastal pockets, like the ones the Nazis held after D-Day, and perhaps mountainous Italy. But generally, any place where Allied naval dominance could overcome the Red Army's firepower. It's plausible that America's industrial advantage could have eventually tipped the scales after years of total war, but suffice to say, the cost of defeating the USSR in such a manner would have been entirely unpalatable to the Western public. These, in fact, were the very conclusions of the British Joint Planning Staff when they, at the behest of Sir Winston Churchill, explored a hypothetical war with the Soviet Union in May 1945. The plan was aptly named Operation Unthinkable, and when the Labour Party won the 1945 general election in Britain and removed Churchill from power, the plan was outright discarded. But across the pond, the Americans were pondering their own approach to war with the Soviets. Truth be told, the Americans were pondering a lot of things in 1945. It was an eventful year, after all. So eventful, in fact, that our dear friends over at Magellan TV have made an exclusive documentary about it. Witness the final hours of the Third Reich, the stirring fire of decolonization, and the first frigid shadows of the Cold War in unparalleled detail. You'll find that Magellan TV offers a curated selection of some of the finest documentaries ever made including other ones related to the Second World War that we may very well cover here in future. 
beyond history, Magellan TV boasts a vast library of over 3,000 documentaries on topics ranging from science and technology to nature, society and more. It is entirely ad-free and can be accessed in pristine 4K resolution across all your devices, wherever you are. And here's the best part. As a special courtesy to SideQuest viewers, Magellan TV are offering you a 30-day free trial if you visit the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen now. But let's get back to 1945, specifically September 1945, less than two weeks after Japan's formal surrender. At this time, the US Army Air Force circulated a top-secret draft that outlined how the Soviet Union might be defeated. Like the British, the Americans understood that anything short of a decisive surprise attack would lead to a years-long total war with the Soviets. So, in preparation for such a first strike, they produced this wonderfully detailed map of all strategic targets in the Soviet Union. You'll notice quite a few of them are beyond the Ural Mountains, where Stalin had relocated a lot of Soviet industry in the wake of Hitler's invasion. This presented the first big problem for the Americans, because you see, the range of the B-29 Superfortress, well, it just wasn't long enough to cover the sheer vastness of Russia. However, there was a small silver lining. The upcoming B-36 would have had the necessary range, which is shown here as the larger, empty sectors on the map. But it was still in development in 1945, and it wouldn't become operational until three years later. Considering the widely dispersed nature of Soviet industry, the number of nuclear bombs required to destroy it was high. The planners worked under the assumption that they'd have access to bombs with similar capabilities to those of Little Boy and Fat Man, the bombs dropped on Japan, which was a correct assumption, since they wouldn't be replaced by thermonuclear bombs until 1952. With first-generation nukes, it was estimated that three bombs would be needed per city. So, a full nuclear decapitation strike would require around 200 bombs. Another 10 bombs were reserved for targeting hypothetical Soviet military bases in the Western Hemisphere, like the one that would eventually appear on Cuba. And a final 10 bombs were planned for strategic isolation of the battlefield, or in other words, disrupting Soviet logistics. In practical terms, that would mean blowing up the Bosphorus and the Kiel and the Suez canals. The international response to such a move was beyond the scope of the study. Assuming an optimistic 50% success rate, the Americans estimated that 400 nuclear bombs would be necessary to vanquish the Soviets. Even ignoring the domestic opposition to such a move, by the time the US had amassed that many weapons, the Soviets had already geared up, and the paranoid era of nuclear deterrence had already taken hold. Luckily, nuclear war hasn't happened since then, and hopefully it never will. For as long as it doesn't happen, we here at SideQuest will continue diligently exploring the lesser-known parts of world history. In the meantime, we extend our sincerest gratitude to our wonderful patrons, and we ask you to stay tuned for the next unthinkably contingent episode of SideQuest.